Okay, so at the end of this class, um, what I want to talk about briefly is this idea of telling stories with data and why that's important and how that's related to um, everything we've been talking about, about um, beauty and truth and bringing the humanities into um, data work. So at the, in the very first session, I proposed um, this. This is one of the slides from session one, um, that, where I said that truth is not necessarily factual. Um, truth can come from anywhere. Truth can be found in literature and, and art and music and other places. Um, and that really truth is the combination of content and form, where if you have some sort of content, some sort of deeper truth that you want to communicate to somebody, um, that takes many different forms. And as long as you follow the rules of specific forms like poetry or music or um, the scientific method, um, then you can communicate that content effectively as long as you do everything right and follow the main principles. And so using those right, correct principles, um, the principles of form, allow us to enhance kind of the facts and the underlying content. And so what I proposed in the very first session is that facts require beauty to be true. Um, and that is kind of an essential part of communication. Um, and then I, I said that art is one method for translating that core content that we want to get across to an audience um, to different forms for those audiences. So art is the, the art of translation. Um, and then I also proposed that stories are a form of art for doing this, uh, for going through this process, for taking some sort of deeper truth and making it so other people can understand it. Um, and what's really exciting about this, this idea of storytelling with data is that if you are doing research and you find some cool new discovery, um, whether it be in the physical sciences, you discover that dark matter exists, for example, or in the social sciences, you discover that Medicare has a positive effect on some aspect of childhood poverty. Um, and you want to communicate that to other people. Um, you could just write a paper and then send it out and hope that people read the abstract and hope that people um, wade through all of your statistical methods and good luck with that. Um, or you can try to tell a story and try to help the reader go through the process of understanding um, your research question and how you got to your conclusions. And in that way, they actually understand the conclusions better and it's more memorable and more powerful. Um, and that's where the power of telling stories for these data um, research projects is really important. And so in order to understand this um, and do a good job at this, it's actually helpful to study and to learn how to tell good stories. Um, so there's this video here. Um, you should pause my video. Um, if you're following along with the slides, watch this one. It's like 16 minutes long. Go make some popcorn, relax, watch this fun thing. Um, this goes through and explains kind of the universal structure of stories and how um, even though every story has kind of essentially the same structure, um, they're infinitely configurable, there's infinite numbers of stories, and they all have very power of, powerful effects on their audiences. So go ahead and watch this and then come back to the video. I will wait right here. And you watched it, I'm assuming. Um, if you didn't, you should, because it's a fun movie. Um, so what you just learned there is that at the core of any story that is going to be powerful, there is a hero. And the story is about that hero doing something. Um, and there's all sorts of tensions as you're crossing different circles. And so in the video, you saw this, this eight-step circle here um, where the hero is introduced. They, have to, they find some need. They go. They do stuff. They go into this this mysterious world here, they change and then they return. Um, it's also this hero's journey, it's kind of the same idea. All stories roughly follow this idea. Um, even if they don't, they subvert this idea. So if there's like a nihilistic story, um, then they'll, they'll have some need and they'll do something and then they'll break conventions and do something else. So like Albert Camus' The Stranger, um, where the main character sees a man on a beach and shoots him. And then that's kind of the end of the story. Like the rest of the story is about the consequences of that. It initially starts with this and then it just kind of breaks. Um, most stories have this structure and they know about it and then they'll do whatever conventions they want um, to break those, um, break those guidelines, um, which then makes the story more powerful. So it's, it's important to keep this in mind when you're communicating about research. Um, your goal when you're writing a paper or a report is to help the reader go through this same process to realize that there's a need for something and then here is how they can search out the 
uh, the data that they need to answer that need, and then here's how it's answered, and then they should get to the conclusion and be transformed. Um, as goofy as this sounds, applying these humanities concepts to research, there's a reason most research papers start with a literature review. Um, it's one of the more boring parts of the paper to write. Um, often you'll just skip it um, when you're reading it, but that sets up this need right here. The, there's a whole reason for that. It's saying, here's what other people have said, there's something missing, let's go find it. And then you engage in the rest of the research paper. Um, and so that helps the audience get more engaged in your research and understand what's what's happening better. And so you can apply these print, these heroic storytelling principles to your own work um, when you're communicating um, about your findings. One thing to keep in mind when you're doing this is that you are not the hero. Um, even though you go through the journey of having a question and wondering about it and then answering it, um, Nobody cares about your journey when you're communicating this. Um, you're trying to help the audience go through this. And one sign of misplacing the role of hero is when you see slides like this. Um, you've been in many, many, many presentations in your life. Um, and often they are just full of text that is useless. And the person presenting will just read every single thing here. And so this is from some hypothetical um, pitch from a startup here saying we want to work with like we want you to invest in us and so if you look at these three slides they're just like incredibly boring um and the person's just going to go through and say we were established in this year we're based here and then they'll just read all of those things this might be trying to tell a story and try to say like and we overcame all these difficulties etc but they're not taking into account the audience needs um, and so it's incredibly boring for them and it's not guiding them on any sort of journey um, because it's just walls of text. It's not taking into account their needs of like they're in the back of the room. They can't possibly read all of this stuff. They're not going to read all of this stuff. If they do read all of this stuff, they don't need you to then read it for them as a script. Um, and so instead, you should have super simple slides and you should focus presentations on the audience needs. You should focus your reports on the audience needs. You should focus your data visualizations on the audience needs. They are the hero. Um, and you're trying to help guide them through that hero's journey and through that process of learning and becoming and growing and changing. And so that, that's your goal here. Um, this idea of storytelling with data has become somewhat controversial. Um, the people that you've been reading in this class, like Alberto Cairo and others, they espouse this uh, wholeheartedly. They love this stuff. Um, I also love this stuff. That's why we're talking about it here. Um, and so I had you read that short one page um, research note from um, Alberto Cairo and a co-author here in Nature that was published in 2013, where they propose that um, authors need to communicate um, their, their findings through the, the principles of storytelling and have an introduction, a question, have conflict, a buildup and resolution. And so they say, do this in your own research and do this in data graphics. Um, have a story arc. You can even try to map out that story arc. But after they published this, um, it started a debate in the journal Nature where lots of other scientists said, no, don't do this. This is bad. And so there was a direct rebuttal, um, the title's great, against storytelling of scientific results. Um, and their main contention, or this guy's main contention here, is that Alberto Cairo and gang do not discuss the pitfalls of this approach, which means that you might uh, distort the data and have unrepresentative data and miss out on lots of the complexities and nuance in your findings because you're trying to guide the reader on a predetermined journey. Um, and that is a legitimate criticism. You don't want to just say, you don't want to have some conclusion that you want the reader to get to that is only your favorite part of the paper, your favorite part of the research, etc. cetera. Um, you want to be as objective as possible. The, the goal of science is to search out truth objectively. Um, and so there are some pitfalls to worry about. But if you can avoid these pitfalls um, and pay attention to when you might fall in them, um, then you can create you know, more powerful stories and communicate stuff more effectively. So we're going to talk about these four pitfalls here. This is the, the summary of the four. We'll talk about each in depth here. Um, but the things you want to pay attention to are uh, manipulation, misinterpretation, um, ethos, and equity, which makes the cool MMEE -E acronym, I guess. Um, so let's talk about each of these in turn. So manipulation, this is um, the issue that the Against Storytelling article um, talked about the most. This was their main concern here. 
Um, and a really good example of this um, came from a few years ago. This American Life, it's a radio um, show in the United States. They have a weekly podcast and a weekly show that they publish about all sorts of current affairs issues and fictional stories and all sorts of fun stuff. Um, in 2015, they did a whole hour-long episode about um, how difficult it is to change your mind um, and to help other people change their minds. And they based this on research that's been done in political science and in other social science fields that has found that if you try to convince people that they are wrong um, or that they need to change their minds, they don't actually change their mind. Um, they might change their mind for like a day and then the next day they'll go back to whatever their previous beliefs were. So it's really hard to get like long lasting um, attitude changes. And so the reason this became a full radio show is because they talked to um, this guy here, Michael LaCour, who was a graduate student um, at Princeton, I think. No, he was going to get to Princeton. Um, he was somewhere. Can't remember all the details, um, but there's a link to um, a story about this in the presenter notes here. Um, but they talked to him and they found that he had been doing experiments where he was trying to get long lasting attitude changes. Um, and his theory was that if you came in contact with somebody who had experience with the thing that you were trying to change their minds about, then you would be able to change your mind better. So the way he tested this is um, he ran an experiment in 2013 um, trying to change people's uh, attitudes about same-sex marriage. And the way he did this is he had a whole bunch of gay canvassers go out and knock on people's doors and um, offer um, political materials um, and campaign materials in support of different measures that were being voted to promote same-sex marriage. This was pre-2015 when it became legal nationwide. And so then they followed up a week later and several weeks later and a month later to see if attitudes towards same-sex marriage had changed as a result of their interaction with a gay canvasser. And so based on his findings here that they were able to publish in Science, which is one of like the top journals um, for all of science, um, what they found, if you look at their plot here, they had four different experimental conditions where they had um, same-sex, or they had gay canvassers and straight canvassers talking about either same-sex marriage or recycling. That was their control condition um, with either gay or straight canvassers. And what they found um, on this x-axis, this is days since they were contacted by the canvasser, and this is a change in support for same-sex marriage. And so what they found is that the canvassers who were gay, who talked about same-sex marriage and campaigned for that for to these people, and they shared experiences about discrimination, they shared about like personal life experiences. Based on these findings, LeCour found that it actually changed their minds for up to 280 days after the treatment, after being canvassed. Um, and that was like a groundbreaking finding and super exciting. And so he was going around to all sorts of different political science conferences and showing off these results. Um, he had an iPad and he, was, he had an interactive graph um, and people could play with it and see all of the results. And it was like this really cool thing. This American Life jumped on it because that's like a, a powerful story. And so some advocacy organizations started doing this as well. Abortion groups said, if we want to um, increase support for abortion, let's send out people who have had experience with abortions to talk about their experiences as they canvass, because that will cause long lasting change. And so like, people started picking up on this. Um, and so that's kind of where This American Life did their story and that's where it ended. Um, but then these two people came along. And as I mentioned, when we were talking about um, that paper um, about austerity and percent of GDP that's dedicated to debt, um, one very common thing for PhD students is to get an assignment to go replicate a paper that is out in the world. And so these two graduate students decided to replicate the stuff from LeCour um, because they were interested in the same topic and because they wanted to replicate a paper. And when they were replicating it, they found that it looked really suspicious. Um, they were able to get the data, um, unlike the, uh, the austerity paper where they wouldn't share the data. Um, the course shared the data with them. Um, but then when they started looking at the data, they noticed that it was pretty irregular, um, that it looked like it was almost generated at random and that it wasn't done by actual people. Um, and it looked too mathematical and too, like, you could fit a very perfect curve to it. And so they wrote a paper about it saying, this looks weird. 
Um, and then they started digging in deeper and started tracking um, his uh, research assistants and found out that they didn't exist and that most of the data was invented, um, which caused a huge like fallout. Like the his co-author here on the paper withdrew the paper from Science. This American Life had to issue a correction and say like, oh, this whole story is is wrong because this wasn't a thing. The guy made up the data, which was like terrifying. Um, and PhD students at that time, that was like 2015 when that was happening. Like I was working on my dissertation then. Um, we all just kind of like emailed our advisors and we were like, our data is real. Don't worry. Um, because it was kind of like this weird thing that was happening in the political science world where this huge finding was invalidated because of false data. Um, so, but the, the danger of this though is that they didn't just like destroy this guy's paper and say, oh look, we found a lie, ha, we got him. They were still interested in the question. And so they ran a similar experiment later um, about transphobia um, instead of support for gay marriage, um, because at this point, gay marriage had become legal. So they sent out transgender people to do the same canvassing thing. Um, and they found that it was still a positive effect, that up to three months after people's interactions with uh, transgender canvassers, they had a more positive um, um, opinion of transgender issues, and they had changed their minds, and it was a long-term change. So in the end, it was like an actual finding. It was just that initially it was based on false data, which then made it hard for advocacy organizations who initially adopted it and then saw that it was fake and then saw that it was real. That's not great for scientific credibility. And so if you're trying to tell a cool story and you let the story get in the way, then it can mess up your findings and it can lead you down bad paths. Um, and then getting that story back on track where this does have an effect on, on people's attitudes towards hot button issues, um, it's hard to get people back onto that because kind of the credibility has been wiped out. So pay attention to that. Don't lie about stuff. Um, so the main um, findings from the main pitfalls to watch out for this are don't lie, obviously. Um, emphasize the story that you're telling, but make the full, full data available. Don't just have like a cool chart and have that be your main finding. You might have one chart that is your main finding, but also include a table at the end with all your regression results. Make it as transparent as possible so that people can go back and check your data and check your work so that you're not just trying to sensationalize your findings. Um, and then that will create better scientific stories and better, more memorable um, reports. And it's just better to do that. So pay attention to manipulation. Don't manipulate stuff. Um, pitfall number two is this idea of misrepresentation. And this is less of a lying issue and more of a marketing issue. Um, so if you've ever read this book here by Malcolm Gladwell, this was super popular a decade or so ago. Um, one of the main things that came out of this book was this concept that has kind of taken over the world of the 10,000 hour rule, where if you want to become an expert in anything, according to Malcolm Gladwell, the thing he emphasized throughout his book is that this is the magic number of greatness. If you practice something for 10,000 hours, you will become an expert in it. I mean, he gives all sorts of examples like the Beatles were a really good band because they practiced in like random pubs throughout Germany for years before they started getting their early contracts and then kind of went global um, because they got 10,000 hours of practice. Tennis players practice for years and years. They get their 10,000 hours and then they're good. And so that was kind of the thing from this book was yay 10,000 hours. He didn't just make it up. It was based on a paper from, two, from 1993, this psychology paper, that said that in general, if people are deliberately practicing something, on average, after about 10,000 hours, they gain expertise. And that was their finding here. But then Malcolm Gladwell read that and said, 10,000 hours, magic number, boom. And then started using that as the marketing approach for this paper. The issue, though, is that the original authors from 1993 never intended for that to happen. Um, they have, uh, they've been trying to correct this ever since. There's this, this article here from a few years ago. If you look at the, the presenter notes, you can click on the link to here. Um, but here they just say, like, there's this popular, popularized but simplistic view of our work that suggests that anyone who's accumulated a sufficient number of hours in practice will automatically become an expert and champion. 
Um, and that is wrong. They've been trying to fight against this ever since, in part because it's been so popularized. And you've likely heard this 10,000 hour rule in motivational speeches and other places. Um, but really, at the core of this research, they find that 10,000 hours is average. Some people do it after 2,000. Some people do it after like 30,000. Um, the quality of the practice matters. You can't just, if you want to become an expert, you can't just go and stand on a golf field. I'm not a golfer. I, would you golf green? Um, you can't just stand out there and hit a ball back and forth for 10,000 hours and, and call it good. You have to have a very focused approach to practicing, very regimented approach. Um, and there are other factors too. There is talent um, involved. You can overcome like talent deficits by extra practice, um, but there's a talent factor. Um, and so there's a whole host of factors. It's not just kind of you count up your hours and once you hit 10,000, you can consider yourself an expert. That is not at all what this means. Um, but it's become popularized that way, um, in part because it's such an, a round, easy number to, to hit. Um, this happens all the time, this, this idea with like Fitbits and Apple Watches where they say you should walk 10,000 steps. Um, that is not really based on research. Um, there's, if you Google 10,000 step misperceptions, um, that was in part because of a marketing thing, because um, designers of these um, pedometers decided that 10,000 hour or 10,000 steps was like a good idea. And so they just decided to do it. And it like the actual research is kind of lower than that, but they rounded up to 10,000 and called it good. Um, so that's again, like watch out for misrepresentation of your stuff. So pitfalls to watch out here is you want to be narrative, um, but you don't want to be too narrative. You don't want people coming away from your findings saying 10,000 hours, that's all we need to do. Um, there's a lot more nuance in there. You need to get the nuance in there so they understand it. And then temper people's expectations of what they can take away from your research. Don't market it as the life-changing um, research about um, childhood poverty or whatever. Like just say it's a very limited, limited in scope. These findings will help in these specific circumstances. They're important, but keep in mind all these caveats. Um, and that will be a more truthful way of telling the story that won't overblow um, kind of the importance of your findings. Um, the third pitfall you want to look out for is ethos, which is um, a rhetorical term um, for kind of the authority that you have to tell the story. And this is, this is important because you, anybody can tell stories. You do not have to have a PhD to tell stories. This guy right here is Bill Nye, the science guy. He does not have a PhD. Um, but he communicates science very well. He has a TV show um, from the 90s. He has a current TV show on Netflix. He's just kind of in the popular press all the time communicating science. Um, there's a portion of the population in the United States that despises him and thinks he should get off of um, television because he's not a scientist and he doesn't have authority to speak for science. Um, but that doesn't matter. He has authority because he has experience and he tells stories well and tells stories truthfully and tells stories correctly. And so because of that, um, he kind of has an ethos about him that lets him communicate science correctly. Um, in addition to him, there's this guy, Alan Alda. He's an American actor. If you've ever seen the TV show MASH, he's the main character in that show. Um, he's also in The West Wing in the final seasons. He runs for president. Um, since retiring from acting, he's created a whole science communication center at a university in New York, where their whole focus is helping um, researchers and scientists communicate their findings more effectively. Um, he has this book here explaining his whole process. Um, because he's a comedian, what he's adopted is um, stand-up. He teaches uh, scientists the art of stand-up. He has them do a whole bunch of like stand-up comedy um, activities and he does workshops teaching them stand-up and then helps them explain their scientific findings to a more general audience using these principles of stand-up comedy. Um, there are all sorts of YouTube videos you can find. Um, you should Google them. I'll include some in the presenter notes here. Um, and it's a really fascinating approach to communicating about science. And the interesting thing here is he also does not have a PhD and he was not trained in rhetorical communication skills or anything like that or how to be a science communicator. But because of his experience, he's been able to um, gain ethos about him where he can speak authoritatively about this stuff. 
Um, and it works because he is experienced. He knows what he's talking about and we can trust him and believe him. You need to be able to build up that trust for, like, from your audience. Um, this has become especially important nowadays with the days and with YouTube and with um, other social media outlets. Um, science communication is a big field um, where there's all sorts of people who try to communicate interesting things. Um, so this is Emily Grassley. She is um, a well-known science communicator on YouTube and works at the Field Museum in Chicago um, and has a regular YouTube channel where she posts all sorts of cool scientific stories. Um, she is a scientist, she's a trained scientist, but she is she does stuff in all sorts of different fields. Um, but she has the ethos and the authority to do that because she tells the stories well and they're convincing and she tells them truthfully and tells them correctly. Um, there's a whole industry of podcasts and radio shows that are focused on science. Um, and none of the hosts here have PhDs, but they talk to experts. Um, they defer to experts, they involve them in their research. Um, and so because of that, they're able to build up this ethos of knowing what they're talking about. And so when you're communicating your findings, um, you need to do the same thing, whether or not you have a PhD um, or have a master's degree, or have some sort of terminal accreditation saying, I am an expert. The expertise, that, like the authority that you get from your expertise does not come from a piece of paper that says, I am an expert. It comes from the ethos about you, um, the ability to communicate well and to give off a vibe of authority. Um, and so having credentials does not make you an expert. Having credentials does not not make you an expert. Um, this does not mean that only people without degrees can be experts. Like people with degrees have experts. But where you get this ethos from is not just having a diploma on your wall. It's being able to communicate truthfully and having a good track record of being able to do that and getting the audience to trust you. And there are all sorts of techniques of doing that um, and making your data visualizations accessible and easy to read gives you, as the creator of the data visualization, the ethos of authority and so that they can follow your, your stuff better and they can believe what you're saying. So try to cultivate that as you're telling stories so that people believe what you're, what you're doing. Um, the fourth pitfall to watch out for um, is this idea of equity where if you're telling stories, you want your stories to be as accessible as possible to the widest possible audience and to involve the most number of voices um, as possible. So a good example of this to introduce um, this concept is another YouTube video. I have it embedded in here. You should watch it if you're following along in the slides, um, where a neuroscientist here is trying to communicate the importance of one of his main research areas, this idea of the connectome, which is um, a structure in the brain that helps us remember things and map out memories and stuff. Um, and Wired Magazine here challenges him to explain what the connectome is to five different people who are at five different levels of experience, so essentially five different audiences. And he does an exceptionally good job of doing this because he doesn't dumb down his research. If you watch this video, if we were in person, we would talk about, we would watch the video together and then talk about what he does well. Um, what he does really well is he does not talk down to any of these people. He's talking to like a, um, a little kid and then a teenager and he's not like, have you ever heard of a brain? And like talking down to them. He tries to figure out how much they know and then he explains some level of this connectome principle to them in a way that they understand. Um, so go ahead and watch this video and then come back and we'll continue to talk about this idea of translation. So if you watch the video, again, he's not dumbing down his findings and making it like super obvious to his audience. He's treating them as if they know a lot um, and then expanding on their knowledge. This is the idea of translation. Um, so translation, you can actually get a PhD in like translation studies. It's a whole field of, of like the theory of translation. Um, one of the, the founders of that field is this guy named Walter Benjamin or Benjamin. Um, and he says that translation isn't just like taking words and moving them to a different language or taking concepts and moving them to a different world of concepts. It is um, the task of the translator uh, consists in finding the intended effect upon the language into which he is translating that produces it in the echo of the original. And so here, this is what the, the neuroscientist was able to do, was this concept of the, 
the connectome is this really complicated concept, but what he was able to do is translate it into words that got the same principle across, the same general idea, this echo of the original to all of his different audiences, um, depending on how complex and how nuanced their understanding of the brain was. And so that's what you're trying to do when you're, when you're shaping um, your findings for specific audiences. Again, it's not dumbing down, it is translating and reworking so that they understand some aspect of it that is kind of an echo of the original. That's your goal here. Um, there's some fun examples of this. Um, this is a comic from the XKCD webcomic. If you go to the uh, presenter view, you can click on the link for it. Um, this, what he tried to do in, in this comic, it's actually a really, really tall comic, is he wanted to explain all of the mechanics of the Saturn V rocket. Um, that launched astronauts to the moon. And so it has the, the lunar lander up on the top and the command module. But he wanted to explain it using only the thousand um, most common words used in the English language. And so he, had, he purposely limited his vocabulary to just 1,000 possible words, which leads to all sorts of like really exciting and funny things here. So this uh, command module is called the people box. Um, it is the part that flies around the other world and comes back home with the people in it and falls in the water. Um, and so this is like an easy way of communicating kind of the very fundamental aspects of this really complicated rocket system um, to people who might not know anything about space or might not know anything about rockets. And it's not condescending. It's, again, translating kind of the core elements of rocket science into very accessible language for any sort of audience. And so that, this is a good example of doing that. What thing, one thing you want to avoid is, again, condescending, but also condescending in ways that are like sexist or racist or make generalizations about people, because then you get into really dangerous territory. And one easy trap to fall in that people often do when they're trying to dumb down their findings or dumb down their product so that anybody can use it. You've probably heard this too. You want to make a chart that is as easy to read, like that your mother can read or your grandmother can read. Um, in Silicon Valley, they love this analogy. Like let's make this app that's easy enough for your grandmother to use. Um, the issue with that though is that's very condescending. Um, and has like inherent sexism built into that whole concept of like this old lady can't handle our app. This old lady can't read our chart. So you don't want to do that. Um, this, this comic from Dilbert illustrates this pretty well, um, where again, it's repeating this refrain of like the interface needs to be so simple that your mother could use it when like your parents do good things and they are smart. So this is bad way of dumbing stuff down. Um, also, as you start getting into the world of explaining things to other people, you want to avoid kind of gender-based um, um, perceptions of others. Um, one common thing that you'll see on the internet often is a thing called mansplaining. Um, and it happens all the time to experts who are women. So here's this uh, journalist named Casey Johnson. This is from a few years ago, in 2014, I think. Um, she wrote an article about um, why women in tech face so many issues with discrimination. And this guy immediately replied and said, read the full article. There's the chicken and egg problem, blah, 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 blah. And then she has to respond like, I wrote the article. Um, and, she's had, and then the thread continues where she's defending herself and saying like, this is what I wrote. Like, I know what I'm talking about. And the guy's like, no, you didn't. And so don't do this. Don't ever be this guy. Um, that's not a good way of like communicating with anybody. That's not any way of building ethos, so avoid that. Um, other things to keep in mind with this whole equity issue is you want to include voices of people who have been left out of general conversations to, to change the shape of conversations. Where this is really important is here. In the realm of science, there are large gender disparities in who publishes and who publishes where. Um, there's, there are gender citation gaps in every scientific field. Um, so international relations, it's fairly large. This is just some other fields, astronomy, um, engineers. Um, what the research consistently finds across all of these different scientific fields is that women publish their papers in journals with um, high impact factors, but they don't get cited as much. Um, or they can't get into the, the high impact factor um, journals because of 
um, extra burdens of emotional labor and childbearing and um, difficulty navigating tenure clock expectations when there are family responsibilities, There's a whole world of like built in discrimination. Um, and so it, it's hard to, to get cited. Um, and it's not just academia. Um, if you look at this, it's a donut chart. So it's kind of like a pie chart, but better, I guess. Um, based on a cable news appearances of men and women in 2016 during the presidential election, they looked at um, the count of commentators and analysts that were invited onto the major cable news shows. Um, and what they found is that on average, only 28% of the analysts and guests were women. And that varied a lot. So that was overall 28%. Um, if you look at uh, Fox, like the Kelly file, who was hosted by a woman, only 16% of her guests were ever female. Um, Anderson Cooper is almost half and half. Um, Rachel Maddow is only a third. Um, CNN's New Day was only a third. Fox and Friends was 20%. And so like there are disparities in who's getting invited to report about their findings and to discuss their research. Um, and so appearances on like popular news outlets is also like a, a gendered field. So one way to avoid this, um, if you ever have the power to decide who should come onto a show or who you should interview or who you should include in your research if you're citing different things, um, there are resources out there that help you avoid falling into this only citing men or only inviting men um, uh, pitfall here. Um, there's a website called Women Also Know Stuff. The link is in the presenter notes here. Um, it's just a giant directory of experts on all sorts of social science topics who are women. Um, and people direct journalists to this place all the time. Um, journalists over the past few years have been getting really good at uh, looking at this list before trying to reach out to kind of big famous names and then inviting people on this list to comment on different news stories and to reach out to them for background research on other news stories. So watch for that. Um, there are also similar networks um, for other marginalized groups. There's the People of Color Also Know Stuff, the LGBT Scholar Network. Um, in public administration specifically, there's an account for academic women in PA. Um, so check those resources out and try to amplify their voices. Um, another thing you can do, um, there's a political scientist um, who has created a shiny app um, that tries to guess the gender of uh, the names in a syllabus or in a, a citation list or a bibliography and then it tries to guess what percent of them are women and try to help you understand if it's balanced or not and then it tries very roughly to guess the race too it's not super accurate um, but what the like the whole purpose of this is sometimes you can create an entire course um, and have no readings by women because again men get cited more and so you just keep citing the people who are getting cited and so this is a useful tool if you're doing any sort of research to just throw your bibliography in there and see how balanced it is. And if it's out of whack, add some more um, women cit or citations from women and increase kind of the accessibility um, of their research and it increases kind of the, the richness of your own research, um, bringing in additional voices. So with this equity idea, the main principles you should keep in mind are don't dumb down your findings when you're when you're communicating to other people. Keep in mind that they understand stuff. Um, you're really just translating things for them and helping them understand it in their own um, using their own mental maps. But you're not going to do it in a condescending way. Um, treat them with respect like they are smart. Treat them like they're smart um, and then try to amplify underrepresented voices to to increase kind of the general knowledge. We don't want to just cite old white men in Princeton and Yale and Harvard who've been publishing for years, bring in new voices that aren't getting used as much. Um, and it will improve your stories and improve your scientific findings and improve the truth. Um, so that is kind of a basic overview of this idea of, of telling stories with data. Um, I would recommend, um, again, there are a whole bunch of different resources out there for learning about this more. Um, on the examples page for today, um, because there's no code or anything, I'll have a section there that has links to a whole bunch of other resources and books about the storytelling principle specifically. So check that out and tell good stories. So have fun with storytelling in the future.